So, uh, hi everyone. Um, my name is Jessica Ford. Um, I am one of the open source maintainers at Project Jupiter. Um, and um, I'm here to talk about some of the stuff that we work on um, that is related to reproducibility and extensibility in scientific research. So, um, many of you probably have heard of Project Jupiter. Who of you, who of you have heard of Project Jupiter? Can you speak just a little bit? Okay, you can hear me? I, you can't hear the mic? Not very well. Okay. Um, sorry for that. Um, I'm going to st stand away from this mic. So, um, just an introduction of who Project Jupiter is. Um, so, many of you are probably familiar with IPython. IPython was the first project of Project Jupiter. Um, it is a interactive tool for writing code and you get to have um, output in the same place. Um, it was created as a tool um, by uh, Fernando Perez, who is uh, at UC Berkeley, to be able to share his research with his colleagues back home in Colombia. Um, he was a physics student in the US and he wanted to be able to share his research and and um, the tools he were using were prohibitively expensive. Um, and so um, being able to create a free tool such as IPython was a really great boon to his research. Um, and so that was kind of our beginnings in terms of our connection with science. It was created in a lab for scientific purposes. Um, but we're more than just Python. So um, this is actually a binder from, I mean, um, a uh, Jupyter notebook from CERN. Um, and if you look in the top corner, that's, um, it says that it uses C++, so you can actually run C++. This is the C++ kernel from CERN. It runs root, which is a C++ library. Um, and so um, we actually are try, try to build tools that can be used uh, by scientists, researchers, um, that are open software, open standards and services um, that can be used across various different languages. And we're nonprofit. So uh, we, I get my funding from various grants. Um, and um, this is our governance document. It's all available online. You can actually see us discuss how we, we organize ourselves on GitHub. Um, and we're more than just notebooks. So. Um, this is Jupyter Hub. Jupyter Hub is a tool that you can use to share notebooks across everyone in a group. So we have like this server hub thing and everybody gets a notebook, right? Which is, you know, an easy extension of the Jupyter notebook. Um, but you can also deploy your own. So we have like a tool that t allows you to simply deploy your own uh, a Jupyter Hub server for small groups. Um, this was originally thought of as a tool for educators um, who may not necessarily have experience deploying um, tools for multiple users. Um, so if you go to the little Jupyter Hub, it'll walk you through it. It should take a couple minutes um, if you have like a cloud account, um, but you can also use it on your use your own machine. Um, but if you want to scale up, we also have tools to do that with uh, Kubernetes. Um, we've used it for open education. We had an edX course that use similar tools to this that had thousands of students um, that was taught by Berkeley. We have um, a lot of my colleagues are at Berkeley, so that's how we end up um, getting inspired by the need to create uh, tools that can scale across large groups for education. Um, and so another example of like how Jupyter Hub is used in science is the Pangeo project. Um, which is a project for large-scale data analysis um, in the earth sciences. So it's uh, sponsored by uh, Anaconda, the NSF, and UC Berkeley. Um, and there's a lot of interesting tools that are being created, um, one of which is a, a large-scale Jupyter Hub deployment that can be used to work with large data. Um, so going back to this whole idea of science and kind of this Pangeo project kind of gets to this is you probably have seen this uh, quote from this paper. Um, this is from Buck and Donahoe who are paraphrasing John Clare about in 1995, um, which was about computational science. And so if you are in a computational domain um, and you are publishing or doing research, um, even back in 1995, they argued that the actual scholarship was the code itself, the, the, the actual um, pipeline that allowed you to actually do the experiment that produced the figures and the result that you present in your paper. And so um, if we're interested then in doing open source science, 
um, what would we need? So what we would need probably is tools to solve a problem, an interface to facilitate the coding and creating, a way to communicate your work and share your work, and then we can like put this all together for replication and to do it easily. So I would like to argue, and there's many different de definitions of reproducibility, but in this context, I think we can summarize it as being able to produce similar results with the same data. And so from my perspective, then I think that um, as a person at Project Jupyter, and this is given how I, I approach the problem, I think of reproducibility as a software problem. So, um, we, we've, talked, we've talked about at Project Jupiter what reproducibility means to us, and we have come up with like two different kinds of definitions. One, which is like technical reproducibility, which is like in theory, with enough effort, you could reproduce the results of a work. Um, and then practically, is like, can we actually make this easy? Can we make this so that anyone can do this? Uh, and and our, our opinion is practical reproducibility should be the end goal. And so there are various different tools that people use today to share their research. Um, GitHub is probably the most obvious one that many of you are familiar with. Um, Open Science Framework is another great tool. Um, CodeLab or Collaboratory, um, these are two separate tools I forgot to mention, but CodeLab is a tool out of Microsoft that does um, experimental provenance. Uh, Collaboratory is a tool from Google. Uh, CodeOcean is another one that allows people to run code. Run My Code is a similar project. Um, and then even research journals themselves are now beginning to publish software pipelines associated with a given research project. Um, and so there are various different tools that are part of this overall pipeline. Once, you, once we shared it, there are actually different pieces and parts that are being used. So we've kind of talked about the sharing and discovery part. Um, and you know, for visualization and analysis, we have various different scientific tools in R or Python or Julia or C++ or whatever. Um, and then you, know, you have these uh, interfaces that allow you to write the code, so RStudio or Jupyter Notebooks or something. And then um, a lot of people aren't necessarily familiar with the bundling and reproducing part who are scientists. It's very common, at least in the DevOps community, to think about these containers um, that allow people to parameterize the whole environmental setup um, computationally. It's used a lot for like web de deploying websites or something like that. Um, so Docker is a really popular tool for that. Um, and so to, to re some, rephrase what I would say, a reproducible pipeline would probably have like dependencies, hyperparameters, data, um, scripts to run the jobs, and maybe some analysis code. But actually, like if you actually want to deal with, with the whole process of trying to reproduce someone's results, like you, even when you have all those pieces, like getting all this stuff up and running can be really painful. So we would like to believe that scientists need open source, community-driven tools to combine all these pieces to make all of it easy so that we can achieve practical reproducibility. So um, this brings me to a project that combines a lot of different tools within the Jupyter ecosystem um, that's available for all of you to use um, both like online and also deploy on your own, which is Binder. And uh, Binder is an open source pr project uh, that uses modern tools for um, scaling and for, compute for interactive computing. Um, and it's for researchers, educators, data scientists, anyone who wants to share um, code in a, some sort of computational, scientific sort of environment. And so um, what it does is it creates reproducible containers of repositories, as I mentioned. So like you have all the different parts of the software and environment in a, a, a tool that you can use that's re deterministically rebuilt, um, and it generates um, Jupyter Notebooks or uh, some sort of session that allows you to run this code um, and you can create, share, and use these sessions and we have a free service that is a demonstration of what this tool can do. So, so this for example is how Binder works, like you click on the button and you go to the website and the website loads, right, and then 
you're taken to a Jupyter Lab instance in this case, and now we actually have like code that's running like on our servers, not on your servers. You don't have to install anything, and it's just like up and running. Um, and Jupyter Lab is one of the front ends, but you don't even necessarily need to use that. We offer like other front ends that you can work with, like R Studio or Shiny or something like that. Um, so an example of this. Um, would be um, from how scientists use it is uh, LIGO um, has an open science center. And if you go to their tutorials, they actually are um, giving you links to Binder that you can like run it. Um, I can show you um, after the talk. Um, and as I said, um, Binder is a project that combines a lot of different projects within Jupyter. Um, so the, no the notebook is one of them, obviously, um, as we've seen with people running the notebook. Um, and then you have Jupyter Lab. But the three projects I want to focus on are Jupyter Docker, Jupyter Hub, and Binder Hub. Uh, we've kind of talked a little bit about Jupyter Hub. Um, I want to go into the details of Jupyter Docker. So Jupyter Docker um, takes a given path to a repository that's a Git repository. It doesn't really matter what it is. It could be GitHub, GitLab, it could be a local path. It doesn't really matter. And it builds a Docker image. Um, and it uses in existing configuration files um, to build this environment deterministically. Um, and it, you can build uh, images in various different languages. Um, and so it gives you a lightweight way to install everything and get up and running immediately. So as I mentioned, a reproducible pipeline would probably have these different pieces. And if you notice like what's missing in here from all this stuff I've previously talked about is like there's no mention of like operating system or like lower level software, right? We're just talking about like what pieces do you need to run the code, not necessarily like all this like additional stuff to get like an actual computer going, right? So that was why we're really excited about using Docker in this case, because Docker is a really lightweight tool that allows you to um, create a little environment for yourself and only worry about the pieces you need to worry about. So um, as I said, it's like relatively simple. You just need to install it with pip and install Docker. And once you've done that, you literally just call this one line with the path that you want. And you can even put in like a commit hash or a branch if you really want to like freeze a point in time and you're really interested in that kind of like deterministic provenance of like here is what this this repository looked at at this time and then it'll go and build and it'll run a lot of lines and then eventually you'll get back this line that will allow you to actually explore the image so if you paste this token in you'll you'll get a Jupyter notebook server or you might even get like a like an R Studio server or something like that, so you can actually work with the code in the repository. Um, and I'd like to argue that we can actually use this then as a reproducibility unit test. Because if we can actually like build an image that like contains the environment of the experiment um, deterministically based on the configuration files, then we have all the tools necessary to rerun the experiment. <coughs> right? So this is kind of like a, an initial step in terms of recreating the pipeline of a computational experiment. So to go back to the uh, LIGO example, right? so this is the, the actual uh, GitHub repository from that URL. So if you go look around, you'll find this. And so in this case, they've created two configuration files. And one, they're saying, OK, you're going to use Python 2.7. And then these are the Python files. These are the Python dependencies you need. That's it. And it looks at these two files and it says, OK, I'm going to build an environment with all the code in the repo and then these dependencies um, using Python 2.7. So we take a number of different configuration files from various different languages, um, Julia, R, um, Python. And then you know, if you want to get a little fancy, we also have, like, if you want to get stuff from apt-get, you, know, you want to do uh, LaTeX or something. Like, we've, we have examples where people have built images using LaTeX and put them on Binder. Um, you, want to, you want to do additional uh, scripting. There's a post-build script. We also even have a start script if you want to do additional, ad additional scripting prior to the building. Um, but we can talk about more details after, on, offline. So um, as I mentioned, things you can do with Jupyter Docker, you can locally um, build environments of any Git repo anywhere on your own machine or on, a, on your cloud server you know, for yourself um, and various different languages. 
and you can run any of the user interfaces that are given to you um, based on the configuration of the repository. And again, as I said, you can basically run it anywhere. Um, and as I mentioned, um, you could extend this to being able to run it with cloud services, and that's something we're really interested in working on further. So um, if reproducibility is producing similar results with similar data, then we want to be able to, the goal of Repo to Docker then is to be able to have one, the author create a experiment, declare the environment, and the other scientist be able to run everything. And so um, we can then produce similar results with similar data independently. And we would like to believe that Docker then opens the door to the laboratory itself because you're then creating the same environment under which these experiments were, were created. Um, and so, again, as I mentioned, like, the Docker can be then used as a reproducibility test. Um, the repo to Docker then controls two main steps of um, the whole process, and then the author needs to define what we need to create this environment, configuration files that are necessary for this. Um, if you use Conda, you can then write uh, Conda export, or you can do pip freeze. Um, so they're actually useful tools for people to do this. Um, and Binder Hub then is a tool that allows public repositories using Jupyter Hub and Repo to Docker so that anyone can deploy this so that anybody can get Docker images and not have to go through the process of downloading Repo to Docker and downloading, um, downloading uh, Docker itself um, so that anybody can then access it. So if you take, so mybinder.org then is a tool that allows people to fill in a GitHub repository URL like in Repo to Docker, click launch, and it builds the image, and then anyone can share that link, and they have access to it. Um, so, like, for example, then, this is another example um, from, from researchers at CERN, right? And this is like, now running on Binder, and now you have the paper and the code, and this kind of gets at what we're thinking about in terms of uh, the, the dream of what Donahoe was talking about, where you can get the paper and the code and, like, look at them as a single unit. Uh, so, I'm going to go real quick. Um, you can deploy your own. Um, two examples of what this is uh, the Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences have deployed their own binder for themselves. And the Pangeo project, as I mentioned earlier, has their own binder. Um, so if you create your own binder, we have a directory. We would love to be able to see what you do with it, and we'll post it online on our directory. Um, we're really interested in uh, federation. Um, this is a long-term goal of us. Um, so you could then create your own binder and put it on your own website um, as a way to share research across the community. Um, and I think as a final thing, I want to just give you one little thing I want to start getting people to start thinking about, which is going back to this idea of the IPython uh, notebook and IPython in general, is a lot of people just want to use IPython just to you know, iterate on ideas, to have some scratch, just kind of, you know, um, experiment a little, right? And so, like, so if you have that, right, and we have this notebook, right, or this scientific pipeline, and um, we have all the tools we need to run the experiment, then we can start asking our questions like, what if, right? Like, you see this experiment over here, they're, they're, this is from a paper from IJCHI, from a group at Harvard, right, they're doing some, um, they're doing some experiments on this colored data set, and you see there's like four colors in here. But we can say like, I don't know, what if this had five colors, right? And so now I can like rerun the experiment with like five colors, right? And I know it's like a simple, small tool in change in the code, but like being able to get to that change used to be so much work, but now we can just make it with a one-line change. And so I kind of want to leave you with this question of like, so we had reproducibility, which was important, but like, what do we do now once we can think of like extensibility, being able to like take code and easily modify it so that we can change the pipeline of an experiment. And so anyone can now look at the tools that someone else did and be able to build upon it immediately. Um, and so that's the question I want to leave you all with. Um, and I don't know necessarily the answer, but I think this is a really exciting area. So uh, let's uh, talk more. Thanks. Oh, just an aside also, like, I guess, again, this is a community run project. These are some of my collaborators. And this is how to get in touch with all of us. 
So um, if you have questions, please queue up at the um, microphone. Great talk. Um, I was wondering if you were uh, at all familiar with the uh, Force 11 software citation group? Yeah, I went to the workshop. OK, great. Because I was wondering, um, what I recall from that is that Dan Cass, for instance, was very adamant, I don't know if he's in the room, but very adamant that um, GitHub in particular was not a good way to publish software. And I was wondering if you could say a few words about that and, and how you maybe some of these uh, ideas do are are good or better ways to actually publish software. I, I, I think it's so. It's really interesting. I think at Project Jupiter, we're a little we're we're not. Uh, and I always forget the dick at the difference between positive and normative. But I think we're the normative one. The nor whatever the we, we I think for us, we're we're more interested in what people are doing and how do we build upon what people are doing in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Like we don't necessarily believe that we can change how people are sharing code. Like entirely, we can only like help people provide better tools to, to create a better ecosystem. So for us, like we just want to we want to kind of go with the flow of what people are doing and try to lead them to to opportunities for better sharing of code. Um, so for us, like we, we we actually have no problems with GitHub. GitHub is actually how we do our jobs every day. Like I I you, I'm on GitHub all the time for my work. So for me, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with the relationship between science and GitHub. Um, and you know, I, I realize that other people do. Um, but um, for us, like it's, this is kind of how, how we've kind of seen what people are up to, and we want to be able to build upon that. It's a long time. I'm not saying there's an issue with GitHub as such. I don't want, I don't want to misrepresent uh, Dan's work, but it's about the publishing part. Never mind. Hi, I'm going to continue that conversation a little bit further as one of the other software citation co-chairs. Um, and I guess my view is slightly different from, from Dan's in that I would love for us to be able to publish on, on platforms like GitHub, but there are still some things that don't quite work for the scientific side. And I guess going a little bit forward, um, what do you think are the tools, because you, you talk a lot about making it easy um, for scientists to publish, and I think that's a great thing. What do you think are the tools that are missing just now that help uh, scientists to publish code in a way that makes it easier for them to go into the regular scholarly communication system until we've had the chance to completely change the scholarly communication system. So in interim, what do we need to do? I mean, well, so I think I kind of alluded to this. Like, I'm really interested in the idea of being able to make sure that the code that you write runs. Um, that's that's kind of the the big, This is kind of where a lot of the pain that I have experienced with other people's code has been is just getting everything up and running. Um, and I realize that there are other problems in terms of like scientific um, scientific research with code. Um, but to me, I think this is this is the most salient pain point, at least from my experience, is working with other people co people's code. So. Um, for us, like we're really interested in being able to get other um, like venues or universities or tools to be able to use things like Binder to sh share code so that everybody can run it. Um, but in order to do that, we need to make sure that people are correctly specifying their dependencies to ensure that this can run. Um, so we don't we we just build an image. We don't really know what's in the image. So, and we don't know if it works. Um, so for us, I think what would be really useful would be additional tools to help verify uh, that people are doing what they say that they will. And we can assess the quality of the code simply from the case of like, you know, is it doing what we think it should do for certain aspects? Um, and right now, people are going to have to write tests to make sure that those things work um, in like our start or our post build files. Um, but I think like if there's there's tools that can like help teach people how to specify their environment or even just like ways of of getting people to make sure that they're writing down everything necessary in a configuration file that like something like a Docker image could be built. I think that would be particularly useful. This is probably a naive question, but there's a lot of discussion about um, uh, convolution engines and artificial intelligence and using training sets to develop uh, something that can drive a decision or uh, drive a, a, a search. Yeah. And is there any way of, of, of representing the, that, uh, you know, the, 
the, the convolutions that were ended up in, 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 in one of these, um, um, I'm, I'm, in one of these containers. You mean, that, you mean like actually like putting together like a pipeline with a machine learning model? Right, right. So because there are, there are machine learning algorithms in R and things like that, and yeah. that's part of the pipeline that you're developing. Can, yeah. can that be sort of communicated or registered? I mean, I think that the whole, there, there is an ongoing discussion on like, you know, like what, is the intellectual property of a model. Like I just read an article like on like Linux people discussing all of this. I don't, I'm not an intellectual property person. Um, I'm, a, I'm a machine learning person, but um, I, don't, I don't delve too much into that aspect of the problem. Um, but for us, like containers have been used for deployments of websites all the time, and a lot of websites have machine learning models there. So I don't see why it can't be done. It would be a pretty clunky model sometimes. I mean, if you're like dealing with like a whole, like image classification system, like these parameters are in the millions, like you're going to have to have a, a, something that's pretty big to build, including the data set. Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't. I mean, the one question, of course, then is like, how do you make sure that, you know, deal with the actual issues of Git? Like, because like typically people don't commit like large files, like they have other stuff to deal with it. Well, it, but, um, but technically, the Docker part is has is done. Uh, it's more that all the other parts are not necessarily. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that the like, reproducibility of uh, machine learning research is definitely something that's very important um, to my work personally. Um, and uh, we can talk more about it. But I mean, can, technically, there's no reason why not you can put an entire experiment in an image. Yep. I'd like to just move away from this technical discussion for a second and, and look at your definition of reproducibility. Yeah. Because I've, when I see that definition, I think, first of all, what does similar mean? Yeah. And how do we measure similarity? Yeah. And I, and I think it leads to sort of the importance of trying to somehow incorporate uncertainty into, into, your, into your notebook that defines your results. And yeah. maybe similar means within the bounds of uncertainty on the original results or something like that. But so uh, just for the group, maybe, how do we think about if reproducibility is getting similar results, I mean, I would usually define it as getting the same results with the same data. And then how far does same have to go from towards similarity before we believe that something is not reproducible? Well, I guess, I guess, sort of. I guess what I'm, the reason why I'm pushing back on this is that my background is in machine learning. And um, there has been good, there has been a, a, a decent amount of work on the fact that um, like machine learning research um, has its own reproducibility problems, um, even when you try to pin down things as much as possible. So, for example, in the computational neuroscience community, there has been uh, there has been work on showing that e like low level libraries like ch create changes in results um, based on like very like important details that would not be thought of by the scientists, like the operating system or what version of um, BLAST you're using. Um, and given the fact that you're, you, you're doing a lot of, um, you're running a lot of stochastic algorithms in order to get to the point of like r producing a result, it's really hard to pin down a lot of those things. Um, and so m that's the reason why I think that um, this, this notion of similarity is, is, is kind of squishy when it comes to that kind of experimental setup. Um, and we haven't really settled on it um, from the perspective of those kinds of models. But I think if you're dealing with something that's probably more simple, you could not have this problem. But even then, for example, like these like blast computations, like you know, you're doing like PCA or something like that. It's not, this is not a particularly complicated model, but at the same time, like given the fact that you're, you, the way you're approaching it is probably with some sort of stochastic method, you probably have, like, you even will have issues with that. So that's part of the reason why I'm a little, I'm trying to, like, walk back how achievable it is, because from a software perspective, it's still hard. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I think the important question is characterizing what similar means. 
And so knowing when you have a similar result and when you don't have a similar result is what I'm saying. I'm not saying it has to be the same. I understand the, the influence of these other things on it, but as long as we know how to measure it somehow, I think it would be useful. Yeah, and I, I, guess, I guess I'm saying that even that is still kind of an open question with regards to um, the actual methods that are being used for certain computations. I was raising that open question, not yeah. expecting you to answer. Oh, okay, sorry, I misunderstood. <laughs> Great, thank you. Please find me if you have more you want to talk about.